Hello, good morning, everyone. Welcome to the M&A Deal Environments in the Baltics webinar. Uh, today, we're going to talk about uh, what's happening in the M&A markets in the Baltics and uh, touch upon a bit in the wider area in, in Europe. And uh, uh, I will be moderating and speaking in, in part. Uh, my name is Elius Burgis. I'm a partner at uh, Cobalt. Uh, uh, together, we have uh, Sharuna Skirus and uh, Sigurds Zelskales of Superia uh, from Vilnius and Riga, respectively. And uh, you as a stream as partner of Cobalt uh, who will be speaking about um, the insurance. So without uh, further ado, I will uh, give uh, floor to Sharunas and Sigvarts who will make an introduction on the European and Baltic uh, m and markets uh, and uh, we'll continue from there. Um, thanks, Elios. Um... While Sigvars is putting up some slides, uh, I would like to thank uh, Cobalt for sharing the initiative and uh, uh, giving us all opportunities to wear ties. Uh, and it's good to know that you can still tie one. Uh, it's like riding a bicycle. Um, and uh, I saw from the list of participants, it's, uh, it's a lot of uh, the deal community, but also uh, real companies. So. Uh, that's always uh, nice to have uh, in a webinar such as this. So, um, okay, Sigvas has, uh, has the slides up, so maybe you can start the ball rolling. All right. So, um, aptly named crisis, what crisis? So let's discuss why have we named the presentation like this today. Uh, there are a few good reasons. Uh, but first, I, I, I'd like to give you a little bit of an introduction to the uh, M&A environment today in, in, in Europe. Um, so overall, the outlook for the past months and since, the, since COVID began, despite really strong deal performance in, uh, in early 2020, uh, you know, this was a classic case of... Uh, uh, of a post-apocalyptic uh, outlook with a weakening M&A environment that still continued into, into quarter three uh, of, uh, of 2020. We've seen tighter financing conditions for deals uh, across Europe and across the world uh, with, uh, with, with the lenders being the lender, uh, conservative in their, in, in, in their uh, assumptions. Uh, we had, of course, we've seen rising distressed M&A and corporate restructurings uh, all across Europe uh, in, 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 uh, in a wide variety of sectors affected by COVID. Of course, this presents an opportunity to uh, strong strategic players who are uh, who can pick up, uh, let's say, uh, a bunch of uh, maybe distressed or, or underperforming assets at a, at a discount valuation. So, you know, uh, one's loss is another scheme. But Baltics is a little bit of a different situation, especially in, uh, in, in quarter, quarter three and now in quarter four. Um, and we were thinking with Sadunas how to you know, best describe this animal we call the Baltic m and market. And, um, and really the conclusion we came to, and maybe some of you will get the reference, because this is a video and, and, and the sort of viral video that came out Around nine, nine years ago or so, uh, we would we like to describe the Baltic m and market today uh, as the honey badger. Uh, for those who don't know, the honey badger is uh, it's a it's a small it's your animal. Pet it's, segment. It's, it's my you pet. Keep one it's, at home. <laughs> it's, it's around the size of a small dog, really, and it, it lives in Africa and Southern Asia, and uh, and you know it's fearless and it doesn't you know. Pay, it pays no regard to whatever is going on around him. He just goes and does what he wants. And the bottom line of the video back then was, honey badger, just don't care. And this is, I think, a good description of the Baltic m and market today. And, you know, we'll discuss a little bit more in detail uh, why and uh, why is the m and market so active uh, in, in the Baltics uh, in, in the midst of, uh, of COVID-19. 
All right. Well, thanks for sharing pictures of your of your pet. Um, I mean, the, the global trends are are pretty sad, actually. Um, and uh, if you can, uh, if you want to look at uh, global deal value, um, it's down across the board. Um, if you if you don't go except for uh, except for uh, Asia, but uh, in Europe it's down. Um, in in America it's down uh, outside of tech. Um, and uh, only if you could go slide down. Um, uh, only you know after a horrible uh, second quarter where a lot of deals were pulled um, or put on ice uh, or postponed when everyone started to work over Zoom and, and Teams, uh, the third quarter is is promising, um, and 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 fourth quarter is uh, even more promising uh, at least from. Uh, such leading indicators as um, uh, as VDR providers uh, activity, which they kind of try to turn into reports. Um, but um, I would just like to talk about uh, how it so happened that Baltics is uh, again kind of a model citizen of Europe where the economies have not taken uh, such big of a hit uh, as have uh, the more Southern uh, countries. Uh, it seems, at least until the second wave, uh, that we've also handled the uh, epidemiological side of things uh, better. Well, that's still, uh, I mean, the jury is out on that one uh, at the moment, I think. Uh, but uh, at least in terms of, of uh, the overall busyness that we feel um, in, in all three sectors, uh, in all the three um, offices that, uh, that we have uh, in Vilnius Liga and Tallinn, I think we, we've never really been busier with more um, really good transactions and really likely to close transactions. And um, that is uh, for an investment bank that is very important. Um, and uh, I feel like uh, this uh, pandemic and the the whole sort of informational background around it uh, has led to a number of uh, transactions paradoxically becoming alive rather than uh, getting postponed because certain things that were never moving or never, were never set to move suddenly started. Um, was it because people suddenly reassessed uh, the, the logic of uh, continuing to hold on uh, with all of their net worth to a single asset, or uh, whether you know the the, the mad confidence of uh, the uh, immortality of business models uh, suddenly was put into question, um, something caused, um, on, on, at least on the on the sell side, uh, certain uh, certain things to move, and uh, I think and I hope. Uh, that also for smart corporate uh, business development uh, people, um, where, which in the Baltics are usually the founder or, or the CEO, uh, it actually opened eyes to, uh, to opportunities and to uh, the benefits that a, that a logical and well-executed M&A strategy can bring. Um, and it can bring multiple expansion uh, upon your own exit. That's why people are looking to expand across borders. Uh, when you are in a sector uh, that is exposed to, uh, to regulation in your home market, it makes sense to diversify your business into other markets where you would uh, be regulated differently by, uh, and would be part of a different political cycle. Um, I think this is illustrated very well with the, with the last transaction we did together with Elius, uh, the, the acquisition of... Uh, of Medica, Cardiolita, and, and the other uh, sort of the, the healthcare business of um, uh, of the Camellia wider group, uh, where a Latvian um, strategic buyer expanded into Lithuania, while at the same time forging a partnership with a uh, with a private equity owned uh, local player, therefore you know killing two birds with one honey badger, uh, uh, and uh, you know immediately. Uh, Growing their uh, their exposure in Lithuania, and also uh, uh, expanding across borders, uh, getting exposed to uh, to two rather than just one regulatory regimes. Um, I think uh, that one more area 
where we should be watching uh, is, uh, is the so far more or less absence of leveraged financing from, uh, from our local banks. Uh, but I have hope, and that's not a completely baseless hope, uh, that uh, that might change uh, because banks are sitting suddenly on, uh, I don't know, a dozen billion more or at least uh, across the Baltics, that's, uh, that's for sure, uh, more than that, uh, more deposits. Um, and suddenly they, uh, you know, they're, they're, they have a problem of lending and uh, the conservativeness of, of Baltic lenders uh, is, uh, is such that it's bordering on ridiculous sometimes, uh, where, especially when we talk about acquisition financing, um, when you go to a bank, there's really no, no one there with, a, with product knowledge uh, to, to, to handle such things. But uh, I think it, they are under pressure to, uh, to deliver returns. Uh, they are under pressure to get market share. We have a private equity owned uh, bank, actually two private equity owned banks uh, in the Baltics. Both are owned by American shareholders uh, who certainly have the expertise. They can import uh, knowledge from from abroad if they can't find any local, and uh, I think that's uh, that's an um, that's an area to watch. And uh, we 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 joked uh, with one uh, private equity investor um, uh, like a couple of weeks ago that the only thing um, standing between uh, the valuations uh, uh, Baltic business owners uh, deserve and the valuations they actually get in transactions is the absence of leveraged financing uh, in uh, in the Baltic. So I'm I'm looking at you, commercial banks, uh, on the on this call if you are there. Um, and uh, uh, that's my uh, quick rant. Uh, I'm the sort of uh, the old uh, guy uh, on the call. Uh, Sigvarts is the one with the, all the smart uh, memes and, and stuff. Uh, but if you could go um, down one slide, please. Um, um, as you obviously saw, uh, what uh, transactions, both in uh, M and A, but but also in um, in uh, in ECM, uh, were were happening, uh, was uh, anything that is COVID re resilient, and and those sectors were. Uh, obviously, TMT, uh, e-commerce uh, is 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 doing fantastic. Uh, everyone is suddenly re re reviewing their business models. Everyone is suddenly uh, scrambling to get online. Uh, anything that helps people do that, or anything that sells stuff online, is suddenly very promising and and valuable. Uh, pharma medical and biotech, not much of that in the Baltics that you can actually buy or, or invest into, but uh, globally that's a sector that's very hot, uh, obviously for obvious reasons. Uh, consumer and retail is, is a mixed bag. I think uh, high street retail, offline retail, uh, non-food especially has taken a, a, a tremendous hit, uh, but it's also uh, the smart ones are scrambling to get online. And uh, I think uh, there's a lot of potential for um, for like old style, old economy uh, retailers transforming themselves uh, if they have the resources um, via transformative M&A uh, into, uh, into uh, clicks and mortar uh, types of businesses. Um, infrastructure and utilities ne actually never got away, uh, gone away. And uh, if, you, if you look at the last two years uh, of Baltic um, infrastructure deals, there's, there's been a whole bunch of them. Uh, in district heating, um, in um, in data uh, infrastructure, uh, in um, there's uh, there's stuff in um, yeah independent heat production. Uh, then power was sold to IDEX uh, uh, with uh, with again hours and, and Cobalt's uh, assistance, um, and uh, that sector continues to be very active. Um, I, I I will say no more, but uh, there will be announcements, I guess, uh, within the next uh, two to three months uh, in that space as well, uh, and uh, more than one. Um, and uh, a sector where, where we have been um, uh, pretty active the last uh, 12 months with closings, we've, we've done, what, three deals in, uh, in, well, one of them 
relatively small, but still, uh, still a deal. Uh, in, in this space, um, uh, all of them in Latvia, actually, uh, uh, in, in cable TV uh, and, and home entertainment, broadly defined. Um, so obviously, when you're under lockdown, what are you going to do? I mean, you're going you're gonna to upgrade your plan and you're going to watch uh, less bad programs. And uh, that's a sector that I think we should still uh, continue to watch and anything that is related to it, uh, such as adjacent sectors that service the telecommunications industry that that service uh, consumers, that service uh, cybersecurity uh, angle is very important. Um, so this is a space to watch. Um, I think there's one more slide. And, yeah, uh, but a little bit, little bit more on the on the on the sectors. Not not really in the sectors, but one uh, one trend that uh, we've noticed here in Riga is uh, an increasing number of uh, of, of Latvian uh, players who are looking to buy something abroad, something in Europe uh, or, or Central Eastern Europe or Western Europe. Uh, it's not very typical for for Latvian businesses to be really active in in cross border M and A. Uh, it's, it's it's no secret that uh, Estonian and uh, and Lithuanian uh, companies are are a little bit more aggressive in that uh, in that sense and and then ready to take more risks uh, uh, abroad. But from what we've seen lately uh, in in, in, in both our projects and and elsewhere is that uh, there's a if those players locally who are strong they see this as an opportunity and a good time to buy something and expand into new ge geographies and that's a uh, I think this is something that at least we here in in, in Latvia we have been waiting for uh, for for, for quite, a long, quite a quite a long amount of time for for business to really be starting to. Uh, to, to look for these acquisitions abroad and building a, a larger um, technology business. So. Yeah, and uh, I would say the last slide, or uh, it's actually a penultimate slide. Uh, we have a propaganda slide at the end. Uh, this is, uh, I think. Uh, <laughs> uh, this is, uh, I think, valid for everyone. Uh, we we all learned to uh, um, to look good on camera. Uh, we all uh, learned to talk to people on on Teams, and uh, uh, even uh, the the older people people among us uh, have finally managed to arrange uh, themselves uh, meetings on on all these platforms on, on Zoom and. and uh, and teams, um, and uh, I, I think uh, Elius and, and Jozas can, can also share uh, their experiences, but uh, uh, of course, I mean, the, the, the diligence, uh, the documentary diligence uh, was always, uh, at least recently, was always online. I haven't seen a physical data room uh, for more than a decade, I guess, uh, but uh, uh, site visits using drones or site visits arranged via uh, 3D cameras uh, up front, um, and uh, you can walk through facilities of a target that you're uh, that you're analyzing uh, in a in a sort of a Google Street View environment. Um, well, that's something new, um, and um, that's for sure um, another reason why. Uh, I mean, I there's more and more. Uh, the more I, I see how people really adapt to. Uh, this, uh, this situation, the more I have faith in humanity and uh, the technical ingenuity. Um, anything to add, Elias, maybe uh, on this? Yes, well, I will, I will add uh, maybe a bit of a lawyer's perspective, uh, more technical, but uh, for sure, the, the times have changed for the deal making and the um, uh, virtuality of the deal making is, is the first one uh, that uh, is very specific for this year. So uh, you go on with your propaganda yeah. slide and uh, yeah. you want to skip that. <laughs> yeah, let's that's, go to propaganda uh, Yeah, just for the logistics, uh, we will uh, be taking questions at the end of the presentations. Uh, so two more to go. Um, if you want to put a question, you can uh, just send a note. Um, in the chat, or you can uh, just uh, hold on your uh, hold on to your question until the end, and we can have a live uh, discussion. 
Um, so uh, taking further than if uh, Sharuna Singers, you are. Uh, no, no, no. We still have the most important slide uh, or presentation here. Yeah, as I said, uh, we've been, uh, I mean, we sold uh, three companies to beta. Uh, <laughs> that's uh, closing dates. So uh, this year uh, we sold three companies to beta. Uh, it, I mean, we sold Baltcom to beta and then two companies to Baltcom. Uh, it's, uh, it's been a, a, a very cable uh, year for uh, our Riga colleagues. Um, I think that Baltcom uh, overall has bought around four cable operators uh, Latvia so far uh, over the past year or so. Uh, yeah, it's uh, it's it's fantastic uh, how companies can uh, you know when they decide that they want to do something and there's a there's a strategy and there's financing behind it. Um, there's there's a lot that you can achieve, and uh, I think uh, Bita and and uh, pr their their main owner Providence, uh, I think, are pursuing a very logical strategy and. Uh, it it doesn't hurt uh, that strategy that uh, that this pandemic happened uh, and uh, it actually benefited them enormously. Um, I think uh, in in at least one of these transactions, I think the business plan had to be uh, revised upwards what three times uh, and uh, in in the course of of, of the transaction. So. Um, it's just because people were switching uh, to to better better plans and then spending more on on cable. Uh, that was that was fantastic, and of course the and for and for private equity owned player like Vita and, and effectively Boston, it's uh, acquisitions like this really make sense. Uh, I mean, it's a fragmented market. These uh, uh, sort of regional. Uh, cable TV, the TV operators, and there's a lot of value add for a private equity owner uh, to, to to take over and, and and create these synergies between uh, between their company and uh, and this uh, portfolio of clients in in, in these regional uh, uh, regional cable TV providers. And uh, I think the last transaction we did with uh, together with Elius uh, here in Vilnius uh, was uh, advising again a, a fantastic example of, of cross border uh, cooperation uh, is the um, uh, acquisition of uh, of Medica and Cardiolita and the whole the whole chain and the whole chain of um, of, of uh, healthcare um, clinics and uh, like these uh, outpatient clinics. Uh, is a is a very good illustration of uh, how if you wanna if you wanna achieve higher multiples for yourself for your eventual exit, and if you want to also uh, hedge your and diversify your regulatory risk across at least two geographies, uh, then that's a that's a brilliantly executed um, strategic step. For uh, for a company that has actually never done a foreign acquisition, so um, we're very happy to have worked with the team. Uh, I think uh, they've made a they made a very uh, they made a very good transaction, very uh, very competitive uh, setting, and uh, I wish them I wish them all the best. I think uh, so far they they they're very happy. Uh, the current performance is very good. Uh, everyone should be using uh, these services. So uh, go on and um, get yourself tested. Uh, I think this concludes uh, the, um, uh, the obligatory uh, propaganda section of our, of our presentation. And um, I think we have now um, time for Elius. Yes, thank you, Sharuna. Thank you, Sigvarts. Uh, so before you uh, start selling your services uh, in this uh, webinar, I will, I will switch to more technical and uh, I will try to quickly run through uh, the, the, the recent trends uh, in the M&D transaction uh, processes. And uh, uh, when I say uh, recent, uh, I'm referring more or less to a one-year uh, period uh, uh, most of uh, which uh, is, is, of course, uh, very much uh, related to this uh, COVID uh, pandemic and uh, uh, certain certain uh, financial crisis uh, and, and, and uh, uh, the deal making uh, obviously has been affected uh, to an extent uh, by that as well. 
before I start, uh, maybe just one uh, uh, detour uh, going back to April this year when we did a similar webinar about uh, the MND markets. Um, uh, one would expect that uh, the sentiment back then was completely different. Uh, uh, there was uh, there were too many unknowns. Uh, the deals were stopped, uh, and uh, the uncertainty didn't uh, really allow us to believe there would be uh, more deals uh, during the year. And uh, uh, financing should be, should have been uh, gone, and and so on. Uh, that was not the case. Uh, I have to remind you that in, in spring uh, we were. Uh, quite optimistic and we were busy and uh, maybe not that much for uh, Latvia, Estonia, but uh, definitely for Lithuania. And when we made um, comments on, on, on what was happening, we really said uh, it was uh, completely surprising uh, because uh, things were not as good uh, around uh, the Baltics uh, in Europe, uh, let alone uh, the world. And um, we were uh, in a way some kind of oasis uh, in, in this uh, m and environment. Uh, a few months have passed and uh, I can only say we uh, were optimistic for a reason uh, because deals were basically never stopped. Uh, Latvia and Estonia recovered. Uh, la my Latvian colleagues called it uh, the deals that were suspended uh, came back with revenge. Uh, so they really uh, recovered uh, in the second, third quarter, and uh, now uh, we can say everybody's busy around the Baltics and uh, the deal flow is, is, is really uh, amazing. And uh, that, that, of course, is not that different anymore uh, if, you took, if you take uh, uh, Europe in more broader sense, uh, so Europe and, and global m and uh, market has recovered in, in the third quarter and uh, uh, the, the yearly results are not looking that bad. Uh, so uh, what, what is really uh, trending uh, in, in this last uh, year? Uh, obviously, the first thing is the virtuality of the deals. The deals uh, have uh, become much more virtual for obvious reasons. Um, and uh, the good news is that uh, it didn't really hurt. Uh, the deal making, uh, at least uh, here in our region, especially for Lithuania, and can, I can say that uh, uh, businesses were prepared, consultants uh, were prepared. Uh, for our firm, uh, we were uh, basically having all the systems that uh, allowed us to, to work remotely already in place, and uh, it didn't take any time for us to switch. Uh, uh, and the attitude for the deal making didn't uh, really hurt either. Because uh, somehow, uh, miraculous, miraculously or not, uh, uh, the uh, market participants uh, were, uh, were ready to switch to uh, virtual uh, deal making, virtual uh, processes, and uh, this uh, didn't really affect uh, the, the quality and, and the speed. To a certain extent, we can say that uh, the speed maybe slowed down a bit uh, because of, of, of the difficulties um, in communication, uh, especially when the deals uh, are cross-border. But that is uh, relevant for um, also physical uh, deals uh, when you have to arrange meetings and to come to one place. What we didn't have, uh, obviously, to the possibility to uh, close ourselves in one room and uh, finish uh, and basically leave, leave only when we finish the negotiations, uh, which, which happened in certain deals, which was really useful sometimes. Uh, this was not that, uh, that uh, relevant for the virtual uh, meetings, but uh, still, I would say statistically, we managed to close, so we managed to sign quite a number of deals. Uh, one deal was very interesting, which uh, we did with Invalda, in the bought. Uh, stake in, uh, in a Danish company which had uh, operations in Poland and China. And we had to do uh, due diligences uh, in, in uh, remote modes. Uh, so as Sharunas was mentioning, uh, these were the processes where people in China, for example, were actually going around with cameras and showing uh, physical um, uh, production facilities. 
uh, whatever they were showing, uh, nobody knows whether it was uh, those production facilities or those others, but uh, the deal was done and uh, somehow it, it was all manageable. Uh, so the next uh, trend is uh, government participation. That is again, very relevant for the COVID period. And um, uh, we have uh, discussed in spring that uh, uh, there, were, there were talks about uh, government uh, chipping in for uh, support to, to those companies that suffered uh, COVID. Uh, we were quite uh, skeptical, uh, I have to be honest, uh, as to whether those mechanisms will be actually established or those would be discussed endlessly. And now we can say that, uh, yes, uh, all the three Baltic states have uh, institutions which are lending or putting equity uh, or, or sometimes both um, and um, processes have already started. Uh, we are uh, a bit behind in Lithuania, but, but the processes are already there. Uh, in Estonia, there were three lending, uh, large lendings to, to save companies suffering from COVID and uh, in Latvia, Altum is also uh, active. So uh, what we were kind of expecting, but maybe a bit, uh, hesitant whether we would have it. So this is in place, so this is happening, and uh, we will see to what extent uh, this will be continued. Well, the money is there, obviously, and uh, the money, uh, the amounts of uh, funds available are significant. Uh, there are other things that are not that relevant to COVID period, uh, but uh, I would say that we, we can see quite a few trends, uh, whether related to virtuality or uh, simply related to a more uh, mature market. So, so one, uh, we have uh, regulator interference, uh, which is becoming uh, more and more intense uh, in the, the Baltic states, but especially in Lithuania, I would say uh, the competition council is becoming a big problem, or has become a big problem already for uh, certain acquisitions. Uh, the market is quite concentrated in certain areas and it is more, more and more difficult to find uh, the ways to merge companies uh, with the proper permits. The regulatory uh, approval process is also taking longer. Uh, it's uh, a lot to do also with, with uh, remote uh, work and uh, uh, but not that, not only that. So uh, th this is, this is uh, certainly a trend uh, which needs to be taken into consideration when planning uh, the transactions. And we looked into some um, uh, statistics around uh, Europe and the globe, uh, how much uh, transactions uh, do actually take. And for the size of transactions that we have, uh, they are above average, definitely. And uh, this is something to bear in mind that uh, our local regulators and supervisors are taking their time to review transactions and uh, approvals uh, are definitely not uh, for granted uh, these days. So you have to be uh, expecting that certain transactions may not go through. Uh, there are certain uh, other things uh, more technical, but uh, also quite evident uh, in relation to due diligence. Uh, so one thing, obviously, we already touched upon uh, the virtuality of due diligence processes. Uh, the, apart from uh, physical uh, virtuality, uh, the data rooms, as Sharuna rightfully mentioned, are virtual mainly for many years already in, in our region. So th there is not, uh, much news, but uh, uh, the physical uh, inspection, so to say, that is something new. It, it was definitely not accepted uh, previously, and uh, this is now being accepted uh, as a necessity in many cases, but uh, I think it's also a shift of uh, mentality, because uh, the same things that were uh, seen as too risky uh, a bit earlier, uh, now are seen as uh, inevitable and uh, acceptable for a due diligence process. Uh, vendors due diligences uh, are becoming more and more trendy. Well, they have become, or they, they came back into trend, I would say. They, somehow for a, for, for a few years, uh, vendor due diligences were not uh, popular. Uh, now it's almost impossible 
possible to see a larger deal without uh, the vendor diligence being uh, produced by the by the sellers. Um, Except the healthcare deal that we did together, that there was no VDD. Yeah, but uh, of course you have uh, certain exceptions. But I would say it's a it's a clear trend that uh, these uh, vendor diligences that are not just considered as they used to be, but actually being made. And uh, the other interesting uh, trend, if, uh, maybe it's not a trend yet, but uh, we have seen uh, a few examples now of uh, only vendors due diligence review rather than full due diligence and the top up review uh, after the vendor due diligence date, which is, which is really uh, putting uh, a lot of confidence on the vendor's due diligence uh, quality. And, uh, uh, this is, uh, I would say, uh, changing the process. It's uh, speeding it up, obviously, but uh, uh, of course, it uh, adds certain risk uh, to, to the buyers. Uh, and that sometimes is uh, combined, but not necessarily with the WNI, Warrant in Indemnity Insurance, uh, which is another uh, trend, I would say, uh, in the last years. Uh, where this is becoming more and more popular in the Baltics. And you will talk about uh, that uh, in, in more detail. Uh, but uh, the quality of the due diligence uh, combined with the WNI insurance is allowing uh, certain deals to happen, in fact, uh, the way we see it, uh, in, or at least uh, simplifying the, the deal. So the, the negotiations uh, are more simple and so on. Uh, then there is the red file, black box, or clean team, or whatever the arrangements are called. Uh, called uh, uh, another trend I would see, uh, which is uh, becoming uh, more and more evident in the due diligence, is uh, where certain files are not disclosed to the potential to the bidders or to the potential buyers uh, until the very late stage of the process, uh, because obviously of uh, antitrust uh, concerns, uh, but, but not on. So when a competitor is buying a competitor, uh, there are more and more arrangements uh, of, of that uh, type. And um, what it means also for deal-making, it's more complex. It's more complex, it's, uh, it takes longer. So if uh, certain other measures uh, reduce the time for due diligence, uh, this one definitely increases. Uh, there are these popular things also for, for the due diligences that are being discussed uh, on and on uh, around the world, uh, especially in, in, in larger jurisdictions, uh, the artificial intelligence and machine learning uh, that would uh, help to uh, improve the due diligence processes. I would say we are getting there also in the Baltics. Uh, we're not just discussing what testing uh, in certain uh, systems that are already there. And uh, obviously uh, these systems need to be taught. So uh, there, there's time to be invested into uh, working with the systems. Uh, I wouldn't say we have already implemented in the Baltics. Some firms would be bragging about uh, them being the first ones or whatever using these systems. Uh, I would say it's still in the test stage. We're too small. Uh, we don't have these huge due diligence processes. So uh, it's coming, but it's coming slowly, and uh, it, it is not definitely uh, yet the, the, the present uh, tool for the diligence process in, in the Baltics. Uh, another last thing with the due diligence, there's a certain uh, larger focus on GDPR, obviously, the uh, thing that we didn't really care about too much uh, two and more years ago. Uh, now is, is becoming a very important part of the uh, due diligence uh, and um, in some cases it can even become a, a deal breaker uh, for, for certain deals where uh, uh, GDPR issues are very uh, big issues for um, retail, for example, and online uh, e-commerce, etc. So um, these would be the, the, the trends, uh, the new features you may say, or um, the, coming, the features coming back uh, for the due diligence. There are other things which are not uh, that um, relevant, maybe again for the period of time, but uh, uh, some, some are like uh, electronic signatures obviously have come into uh, much bigger use 
it's not that much maybe uh, directly relevant for the MNA, but uh, definitely in MNA transactions, we have a lot of documents also being signed uh, along with, with the main agreements. Uh, uh, this uh, definitely simplifies. And that, that there's, I would say that there has been a breakthrough of uh, electronic signing, even notaries to an extent are accepting uh, some doc documents uh, verified electronically, uh, etc. And so this is uh, the direction that we see and uh, it, would, it will only continue. Uh, now, the last but not least, uh, uh, the direction where m and deals uh, can be seen going, uh, I would uh, take two trends. Uh, one is, is not that new. Uh, Baltic companies, uh, Baltic businesses uh, investing abroad. Uh, and this we have seen uh, for a few years already, uh, but uh, this trend is clearly gaining speed. Um, uh, so more and more uh, local businesses are expanding, uh, more investments are being made. And of course, uh, we are also assisting uh, those expansions um, because of the local element and the, the local element being uh, more comfortable with uh, local advisors, uh, there have been uh, more deals and there will be more deals. And we hear that uh, Latvian business are finally on board as well. They, they I have to admit, uh, Latvian businesses were uh, well more skeptical, were more maybe careful in, the, in that respect. But Lithuanian uh, companies were. Uh, very active in this area and uh, investments like uh, involved into this uh, Danish company MBL, which has really nothing to do with our region directly, uh, the Baltic uh, market. Uh, and the, these are the types of transactions uh, that uh, really uh, make a trend of this foreign investment. And the other thing is the generational shift uh, in uh, uh, Baltics combined, uh, obviously, there are a lot of businesses that have been uh, started by uh, the first generation uh, businessmen and uh, now uh, they are close to retirement or retiring and uh, uh, they're not necessarily ready to uh, uh, give their businesses, give the management of the businesses to their family members, to their children or, or someone else. So this is uh, definitely a, a large batch of uh, businesses that are put on the table and we've seen transactions also this year, uh, which will be changing hands. Uh, and uh, it's, it should be expected that uh, this trend will only continue. And uh, there are definitely a lot of uh, targets that are still uh, uh, potentially changing hands in the very near future. So this is something to watch and uh, uh, we will be seeing more of these transactions as well. So this uh, concludes uh, my part uh, and uh, I will happily give floor to Joazas who will speak about uh, m and insurance. Thank you. Uh, thank you, Elius. So let me share share the slides. So um, for those not closely familiar uh, with the double NI insurance, let me quickly define, define what it is. So uh, this type of insurance covers only uh, Um, it covers uh, losses arise, arising from breaches of warranties under share purchase agreements. So if the buyer has taken out an insurance policy, he will provide the claim to the insurance company and not to the seller. Uh, the seller retains liability under the SBA up to the limit of the insurance policy uh, called uh, retention. And uh, for certain items uh, which are not covered by the policy, 
and those are called exclusions. So this type of insurance was uh, um, several years ago, very expensive and not providing much coverage. The market has evolved uh, gradually and this product is, being, uh, be is becoming affordable also in the Baltics. So there are deals uh, in the Baltics where the buyer, especially if there are competing buyers, uh, is willing to spend a certain amount uh, of money to secure a deal. And this has been a clear trend before COVID, and this is true during the current pandemic environment. Uh, based on the data by, uh, collected by, by major international law firms, so in Europe uh, last year around 20% of all M&A deals involved an insurance policy. While the percentage in the UK uh, or among private equity exits was as high as 40-40%. It is uh, still an instrument for the larger deals. Uh, again, uh, last uh, year in Europe uh, for smaller deals on the European scale, uh, the, only about 7 or 10% had insurance. Uh, while uh, for large uh, deals over 100 million, the percentage was around 50%. However, uh, insurance is becoming affordable. Uh, just a quote from a UK broker, there's an erosion of minimum premiums, mean, meaning that deals can be insured for as little as 20,000 pounds premium compared to a minimum of 100,000 uh, pounds um, just a few years ago. Uh, the premium uh, for the insurance policy is calculated uh, by reference to the policy limit. So the uh, limit of liability that is insured under the policy. And the rate in the UK is typically somewhere between 1%, 1.3% of the, of the policy limit, higher for the smaller dealers, uh, deals of course. Uh, on average, uh, that insurance uh, policy limit is uh, around 10 to 30 percent of EV of enterprise value, sometimes up to 40 percent. So, what it means in the Baltics? It means that for a deal with a value of 8, 10, 15 million euros already, you can increasingly see the negotiations to have insurance uh, that would cost around uh, 1% or 1.5% of the policy limit, which means in very practical terms, uh, 60, 70,000 euros uh, expense, an additional expense to the, to the transaction. But you have to note that the buyers do not always pick up the premium. But last year in European deals, advised by one global law firm, buyers paid uh, um, only for 70, 80% of insurance policies. So it means that the rest was either paid by the seller or split by the buyer and the seller. Uh, still, is, is, is the insurance worthwhile? If, if the expenses are okay, what about the exclusions? So there are a number of uh, the so-called market standard exclusions uh, that uh, we would expect um, on, on, uh, on an insurance policy. But uh, now we can usually negotiate with the insurers to get them more comfortable to, to remove the exclusion completely or reduce it in, in scope as the market is increasingly competitive. An example could be anti-bribery and corruption or, or uh, GDPR compliance uh, coverage. They were excluded previously, not so much anymore. Uh, other standard exclusions could be pollution or transfer pricing, sometimes product liability, sometimes physical condition of assets. But again, uh, for these items, you would not get entrance in the first offer, but you can negotiate it and, and get it more and more frequently. So uh, with the pricing uh, getting better and uh, exclusions being negotiable, uh, there's an, still uh, an obvious impact on deal process that insurance has. 
So from, from my own observations uh, on several deals where we have advised uh, the insurer or the parties, we had different experience, uh, insurance uh, puts more common sense in, into the process. So the list of warranties is shorter, meaning more reasonable. Um, small claims threshold is, is higher, again, more reasonable. It makes negotiations over the representations and warranties more reasonable. If the buyer was not interested in certain topics in due diligence, for instance, decided not to spend time checking data protection matters, for instance, they cannot ask for a representation or a warranty uh, on, on GDPR at all, because uh, this, the due diligence was not taken care of properly and the insurer would point to that. So in turn, it means better quality of the due diligence. Uh, so since insurers will typically exclude from cover any matter which is identified as high risk in the due diligence, the specialists have uh, to adapt to this approach and uh, research the matters, hopefully to the point uh, when the issue is seen as low risk and therefore uh, will be covered by the policy. Uh, also, it means um, fewer escrows, uh, fewer uh, deferrals uh, in price, uh, because you have a WNI insurance to cover for that risk of the purchase. Um, in general, you will see more, uh, lower liability caps for the seller, generally more favorable uh, li liability limitation provisions. So you would see liability going, uh, the liability cap going down to 30, 40% of the purchase price or lower. And uh, you have to note that it's really good for the seller because there is no recourse to the seller from the insurer, except in the cases of fraud. Now, uh, uh, what about uh, the outlook of insurance now in this uh, current turmoil? So what about the pandemic? Is there um, any policy cover at all for the losses that might be related to the pandemic? So in initially uh, this year, in insurers in Europe have uh, seen a significant decrease in, of insurance requests. But later this year, they confirm they have not seen any real restrictions or withdrawals of, of insurance capacity. Mm -hmm. and although there's definitely um, reduced activity in certain sectors, you know, hospitality, travel industries, etc. Mm, but the insurers, uh, provided they are satisfied that due diligence has been done properly, uh, they will be pro pragmatic even in respect with uh, COVID, with pandemic uh, uh, coverage. So they will not be offering blanket exclusions. In some cases they will, they would be not covering uh, employment matters, certain employees catching the virus or something like that. But other than, otherwise they would be, uh, they would consider each deal on a case by case basis in terms of coverage. Now, more generally, um, there are some trends uh, uh, that um, you would see coming soon in uh, warranty and indemnity insurance, also in the Baltics. And the first one is uh, CLR or contingent legal risk insurance. Um, WNI insurance policies are designed to cover unknown risks by definition. However, underwriters in, in UK and US are increasingly offering terms uh, on, on known risks covering uh, intellectual property, cyber, environmental risks. So far, the high price and uh, there, it, it's a high price issue. Um, they, they might have might have unexpected gaps in coverage, but it's definitely a trend. Um, Another one is synthetic policies, so-called synthetic policies. It means there is an agreement between the buyer uh, of shares and the insurer regarding a set of warranties without 
the seller providing any warranties at all. So this is a product that uh, the insurers are developing due to popular demand, so to say. But this is the uh, development thing also that would eventually come to, to the Baltics as well. Um, one more um, trend is the increasing availability of new breach cover. What it means under the standard insurance policy in the period between signing and closing, if a buyer acquires knowledge of a breach, it, it has no uh, right of indemnity under the policy. Mm -hmm. New breach cover would provide an indemnity in, in, in such case. This is subject to a 20% premium increase and, and pandemics may uh, undermine um, insurance willingness to offer uh, this, this type of cover, but this, this is also a very useful product in some cases and it will be a developing trend. So all in all, uh, insurers are looking ahead with, with more optimism now to the market. So we may expect uh, insurance becoming more and more prevalent in the Baltics as well. And uh, on this note, so that's, that's it for me today. And I would like to thank you for your attention and give the word back to, to the moderator, to Elise. Yes, thank you. Yours is, um, I don't see uh, many questions in the chat yet. Uh, so uh, be brave and uh, shoot uh, out any questions you may have. Um, we will try to answer them, but um, maybe just uh, to keep uh, everyone uh, in the call for a few other minutes, um, we can do some predictions, which is always very interesting uh, for the listeners, and maybe we can disclose some uh, secret information. Uh, so, uh, Sharuna, Sigvars, uh, what, what do you have? Uh, what, what would you say that in the next years, let's say, uh, what will we see in terms of uh, M&A transactions and uh, uh, maybe some uh, unexpected moves? Well, I think one field where we're going to see a lot of activity next year, and uh, and I, I I think that most or a lot of uh, a lot of listeners today have access to all kinds of fancy databases and M and A data. Uh, you know, it, 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 there has been a lot of movement in, uh, as we mentioned, infrastructure power in the intelligence sector, and I think we're going to see uh, several sizable deals uh, in, uh, uh, in in this space next year. Um, or, or even this year, uh, so that's uh, that's one quite uh, quite active sector here. Yeah, I would tend to agree with Sigurd. Uh, that's uh, the, the broad uh, power um, energy utilities sector is going to be is going to be pretty active. Uh, I would say uh, <laughs> no, I wouldn't say. Sorry. <laughs> <laughs> Nice try, Elias. Yes, yes, yes. Well, well you can write. Uh, you can write and I will read. Uh, so it, it will not count. But uh, yeah, so, so the, the sectors are quite clear and I understand that um, if you are in TMT, so technology, media, telecom, if you are in uh, pharma, medical, biotech, PMB and, and energy utilities, you are good to go and uh, these are the areas. Uh, in fact, it's interesting that uh, these are the areas uh, uh, trending also in Europe and beyond. And uh, the Baltics are not uh, an exception. So uh, even though we are quite different in a way that we saw this year uh, in terms of activity of the m and but uh, the areas themselves, um, of course, these are wide areas, but uh, they, they are kind of uh, matching uh, the global trend, um, so to say. But uh, maybe what is a bit different, uh, again, we didn't see large deals, and that was also the same for, for global m and in the second quarter, the, the third quarter it picked up. Uh, we uh, don't really see large deals coming back, well, apart from uh, maybe the uh, the Camellia, Cardelita, and, and so on, a deal that, that was a big deal, but then was split in two 
the Fortum deal, which is ongoing, uh, that's a large deal covering also Poland, but it's still in, it's still in the kind of mid stage. Uh, other than that, I don't really see uh, large deals uh, coming back. Is that um, so what Baltics? Well, I would say, you know, without maybe oversharing too much, but uh, our pipeline is uh, is looking quite good. I mean, uh, for Baltics, I would say anything above 50 million is already a sizable transaction. So there's a whole bunch of those uh, in our in our pipeline, and actually across uh, across the three across the three offices. Uh, I mean, Tallinn is is busy uh, like it never was. That's why it's just Riga and Vilnius now. They didn't even have time to prepare and be on this call, uh, and we barely did. So um, you know, we have 15 minutes, and then then we go back to the to the stock list. <laughs> So you say 50, yeah, 50 is a large deal, but uh, not a mega deal. So mega deals are above uh, 100 probably for, for the Baltics. And these are A not... couple of those as well, a couple of those as well, inshallah. Okay, so, so basically we're back on track and uh, nothing uh, really affected by this uh, pandemic and uh, the prospects looking good. And what about um, uh, the stress deals? Uh, in spring, again, we talked about those uh, coming up, but we predicted that uh, there would not be a, a significant amount of distress deals uh, before the end of the year. So we're closing to that. And uh, it seems that uh, there are not so many or, or not really any uh, significant distress uh, assets being uh, sold or changing hands or being uh, so financed uh, heavily by, by investors and equity investors. I think uh, the reason for that is that uh, the government, uh, at least in Lithuania, but also to, to an extent uh, everywhere, more or less in Europe, um, with the help of uh, more or less unlimited central bank uh, uh, resources, have uh, flooded uh, everyone. Including the corporate sector, um, with financing uh, furlough payments to employees, and uh, as um, as one of the bank economists uh, rightly said uh, during one of his interviews, I think about uh, a month ago, that uh, the the tax authority in Lithuania has become uh, the fifth largest corporate lender this year, with uh, I think over half a billion uh, euros in uh, in loans to to enterprises. So. Uh, there's really no distress felt at the moment. Um, uh, having said that, we should bear in mind that this is not free money. I mean, it's uh, it's deferred, not forgiven. So um, it depends uh, on how how well the companies manage to transform themselves, how well the companies manage to transform themselves, um, and uh, uh, to weather this uh, this uh, this hardship period. And uh, when time comes uh, to, to repay uh, that support. Um, then again, uh, it's uh, in the Baltics, uh, it's, but also elsewhere, uh, where you know, we don't really have a very well functioning um, bankruptcy and restructuring system. Uh, it's, it's still in its infancy compared to Western Europe. So when we speak about distressed uh, situations, we really need to make a distinction between distressed target and distressed seller, because it can be uh, completely different. It usually is a completely different thing, uh, where you know, if a company is troubled and is being sold more or less by the creditors, um, it's a completely different ball game and it's a completely different uh, tactic uh it's a completely different process uh timing pressure is enormous um whereas if it's a distressed seller then uh yeah i mean things also tend to move uh, slightly faster but uh, usually the assets uh, that are sold are the assets that can be sold and the assets that can be sold are usually better than the ones that you must sell so um, it's uh, i would say uh, i haven't seen anything come online yet just because the, the market has been flooded with all sorts of uh, financing. As I said uh, in the beginning, the banks are uh, flush with deposits, uh, scratching their heads what to do with them. 
Um, and uh, therefore, there's no widespread um, distressed selling of, of, of good companies. Uh, but uh, who knows when uh, when uh, it's time to uh, you know to pay the piper, as they say, uh, we may see some of that as well. Yeah, I think really the uh, the only distressed cases that we are looking at here are companies that were already in distress in in, in some terms uh, before COVID. And uh, the COVID effect has amplified, uh, amplified that uh, financial situation. Uh, you know, for larger companies that have had strong balance sheets and enough liquidity uh, to weather the crisis, uh, they've they've had access to all sorts of instruments to uh, to, to get through this. Uh, for example, the uh, the new uh, fund set up by Altum, uh, the Latvian state agency. Uh, together with uh, with several pension funds to uh, to invest in large uh, businesses in Latvia, uh, so so that's one example of uh, really proactive financing, uh, at least here here in Latvia that uh, that large enterprises uh, have access to. So Altum has already invested, or it's uh, investing as we speak. It's currently investing. They set the fund up. I believe this was uh, end of summer, uh, so they are actively uh, looking at uh, at investments. So I, I I don't can't really comment uh, in, in more detail on uh, on that, but uh, but yeah, they are they are actually looking at uh, at investment opportunities. The Lithuanian equivalent is also maybe worthy of note. Uh, that uh, it I think the one of the uh, one of the godfathers of the idea, Mr. Jurgilas from the Bank of Lithuania, stated the potential ownership of uh, key Lithuanian uh, corporations by uh, by new owners as one of the main reasons why we needed to set up this uh, uh, state investment fund, uh, which is now. Uh, uh, as, as they as they proclaim in in the press is is dealing with a with a large number of, of cases and uh, um, I, I wish them all the best uh, and uh, although from from you know from from lack of uh, uh, market rumor or market discussions on what actually it is that they're doing uh, I can I can only speculate uh, and uh, when I speculate, I can't come up with any names. So it's it's just uh, it's just weird. Uh, and uh, but I I mean they, they they can't be lying. So they probably are dealing with uh, with some uh, some situations, and they're probably uh, working on on a number of transactions because they need to deploy a lot of capital, and time is ticking. Um, and uh, uh, they only just collected the team a couple of weeks ago or a month ago, um, and. Uh, they should uh, they should get busy if, if they are to deploy that capital. The question is is there a, is there a receptive audience of that money? Um, that remains to be seen. Well, well, there is. I I can uh, say that because uh, we see already a few targets. Uh, we're working on one, uh, so uh, it's it, do, it does make sense. Actually, I was uh, skeptical in spring, as I said. Uh, uh, but we do see a few targets which uh, really were affected and it's a direct effect uh, of COVID, um, uh, especially those that uh, were trading abroad and uh, only the logistical part uh, being uh, broken uh, put them into a very hard situation uh, in terms of uh, fulfilling the contracts and, and, and orders. So, uh, there, there is uh, a segment, I would say, of uh, targets that uh, are eligible. Um, we will see uh, how it goes with the investment themselves. In fact, they invent uh, the process on the go, uh, which is not uh, helping really the deal making. But and, and they recently just announced that they will add uh, smaller companies to the portfolio or to to, to the to the uh, targeting uh, portfolio because uh, they were aiming initially at larger larger companies, 
but um, we will see uh, until we see actual results, actual examples. Um, this can only be uh, theoretical, and uh, it is also partly political. So we will see what what's uh, how this develops. Uh, but. Uh, State is one thing, but uh, there's a lot of money in private equity. There's a lot of money in the banks. Uh, there's a lot of money in the businesses. In fact, the, the ones that were not hit by the pandemic, uh, they are definitely going to look for the targets. And uh, uh, the distress situation combined with uh, this uh, overflow of money, and I'm not even speaking about this uh, helicopter money or whatever you call it, uh, how would that affect the prices? Because uh, it seems that uh, the good purchases with a lot of money may be buying bad targets for a reduced price, but it may also seem that um, the prices will not uh, go down, but instead increase because there's just a lot of money to be invested. Every deal is special. Uh, there's a, always a special circumstances surrounding every situation. And I would say that, um, you know, you say private equity has a lot of money. Of course they do, uh, but they also need to make their, uh, their return. So they won't buy, like, you know, bad assets at high prices. They will buy good assets at good prices uh, and then maybe do some magic with them. Um, what private equity actually, uh, and, and there's a lot of funds to be deployed. So still, I mean, Boltcap is deploying its uh, its third buyout fund. Um, KJK is deploying their fund. Uh, Livonia still has money to burn. Um, and uh, in Valdelite. Uh, and in Valdelite, I mean, you name it. Uh, I mean, it's it's a golden age of Baltic private equity. Uh, or maybe it will be referred to as such um what but they what they have done uh, also in the past both them and, and for other strategic buyers is they have created uh, a whole bunch of uh, people suddenly with uh, money to spend uh, and invest so uh, a lot of baltic exits have created uh, um holding companies and family offices. And uh, I think uh, that's an interesting uh, and much less structured um, uh, community of investors uh, that uh, will be growing in importance in the next couple of years, I would say. Um, and uh, we already see uh, that activity uh, in, in the, in the mid-range uh, transaction uh, space. Um, they obviously are very active in, in real estate, or, I mean, real estate is not the subject of today, but um, that is there's a natural area where a lot of these people gravitate uh, for historic reasons. For um, I think uh, still good returns to be had there, and uh, uh, somewhat uh, of, a, of a fetish for real estate among Baltic uh, Baltic um, investors. Um, but uh, a lot of that is also uh, going into companies. So. I think that's a, that's an interesting space to watch as well. Sigvar wants to say something, or is it only me seeing you? We have a question, guys. Yes, we have a question. So uh, from the audience, and we definitely have to answer that. So, uh, do you yes. see an increasing role of sustainability and ESG in them? And perhaps a few comments in general. Where all where where are the Baltic countries in adapting ESG? ESG policies practices. Thanks. So uh, I may start with a few uh, words. Uh, I actually wanted to mention ESG as uh, one of the trends uh, that uh, due diligences have to target much more than before. But I then intentionally omitted it uh, because it's still in a very early stage, I would say, in the Baltics. And uh, Yes, it's on the table. Uh, it's uh, something to be uh, investigated, especially when the foreign and institutional investors are coming in. But uh, there's not that much, I would say, still happening. Maybe in terms of governance, but not that much of uh, environmental social responsibility. But that's maybe just my view. So you others, maybe you can, you can or Sharun as you others, maybe you can add. You just want to go first, or? Well, uh, I think uh, it would. Uh, it, it, when it comes uh, uh, really to the to the Baltics, it will be still 
for the uh, largest deals and for specific types of, of uh, investors, as Elias uh, rightfully pointed out. But so far, I wouldn't say it's a fixture or any feature of, of uh, all the m and markets so far, at least for mid-market deals. Yeah, I would tend to agree. Uh, it's, uh, but it is uh, somewhat uh, becoming ingrained uh, more in in commercial diligence. These uh, the more you know the SG sections. Uh, environmental, not so much because it's not relevant for every business. Um, uh, and of course, uh, anyone dealing with uh, stuff that has potential uh environmental liabilities obviously addresses that in in uh, in, uh, in MA. Um, famously uh one transaction this year uh fell through uh because uh of um, well i don't know the details but uh, it certainly was caused by an environmental looming and then later materialized uh, environmental liability at uh, grigero uh, plant in Playpada. So I think uh, cases and situations like this, um, they, they bring awareness uh, to, to the importance of having not just, uh, you know, pro forma policies, but an actual active uh, agenda uh, on, on top of the management's um, tables uh, to actively address those issues in day-to-day -day activities. So, if uh, no more questions, and I'm uh, cautious about time, uh, these days it's uh, very valuable as as usual. Uh, I will thank uh, all our participants and speakers, and uh, really appreciate uh, spending your time uh, to listen to these uh, insights. Um, and uh, we will be doing uh, another round uh, somewhere in spring. So stay tuned. Follow us on. Uh, uh, well, I want to say you're welcome. Uh, the Mara said we don't have that, so on Facebook and LinkedIn. Um, so thank you very much. Yeah, thanks, Elias and Valdemaras. You're welcome. He just thanked us all on chat. All right, all right. thank you, everyone. Bye. Bye. Bye.